Hello and welcome to lecture 8 in thermochemistry. Today we're going to look at collision theory. Um, I've given you, of course, um, one final look at the knowledge outcomes prescribed by Alberta Learning. Uh, we're near the end of the unit, so ho hopefully your mastery of this material is, um, is rounding out nicely. Of course, these form the basis for the bulk of the diploma exam questions that you'll see. Collision theory is an interesting... Um, uh, chapter of material. Um, it's thought that all chemical reactions occur as a, as a result of collisions between particles, such as atoms, molecules, or ions. However, not all particle collisions give rise to a chemical change. For a collision to result in a chemical reaction, it has to be what we refer to as an effective collision. And eff effective collisions have two requirements. Firstly, the particles have to co uh, collide with sufficient energy, with sufficient minimum kinetic energy. We refer to this as the activation energy, and we designate it E sub A. The particles also have to come together with the appropriate orientation. And if particles collide with enough energy and at the right orientation, the collision will be effective and a chemical reaction will occur. Uh, if they don't, then no chemical change will take place. At the moment the particles collide, uh, an intermediate particle is formed, and we call this particle the activated complex. It's essentially um, the particles, uh, while, uh, the, sort of the sum total of the particles while in collision. Um, we can draw a potential energy diagram now um, and modify it to include the activation energy for the overall reaction. And here is what a typical uh, potential energy diagram would look like for an exothermic reaction. And just to get the exothermic piece out of the way, you see the reactants are higher in potential energy, the products are lower in potential energy, so energy has been lost to the surroundings. This is an exothermic reaction. The new piece is the hump we see in the middle. This purple hump that starts at the reactant's energy level and goes up in potential energy before coming down to the uh, potential energy of the products. This hump is the energy required uh, by the collision to give rise to chemical change. The particles have to collide with the minimum energy, with the activation energy, for the chemistry to proceed. Um, and, and you'll notice that activation energy is represented by an increase in potential energy. If you think about it, the particles are are approaching one another, so their protons begin to interact, their electrons begin to interact, interact, and their protons and electrons begin to mutually attract. And again, so we have particles having mass that enter the influence of each other's uh, attractive and repulsive force fields. So uh, potential energy increases here as um, particles approach one another. That's why we see an increase in the potential energy curve here. And that's, uh, as I've said, it's because the particles are approaching each other's um, attractive and repulsive uh, force fields. The graph explains <coughs> uh, excuse me, another uh, interesting uh, phenomenon in chemistry that when you mildly heat any chemical system, whether it's an endothermic or an exothermic system, you initially speed up its reaction. And you do so because the heating process provides uh, the activation energy for the reaction to get over that energy barrier. You're transferring kinetic energy into the system. The particles are moving with greater average kinetic energy, so their collisions are likely more likely to have more, enough energy to react. And that's simply spelled out here in, uh, in black and white. The following graph is often used to explain this effect. And... Um, Go, it's sort of a famous graph. I've modified the axes a little bit. The y-axis is the number of collisions, and the x-axis is total kinetic energy of those collisions. Typically, this x-axis says kinetic energy of particles, but really when it comes to collision theory, we're not talking about the particle speed. We're talking about the total kinetic energy of the collision. So we're talking about the sum total of the particle's speed. Um, Having said that, it doesn't sh change the shape of the graph. It just fits in more neatly with kinetic, uh, rather with uh, collision theory. You'll notice there's a vertical dash line here that represents activation energy. So all collisions to the right of this vertical line have sufficient energy to be effective collisions. 
The particles have to, of course, come together with the proper orientation, but if they do, they have enough energy to go through chemical change. Um, you'll see that there are two temperature settings in this graph. T1, represented by the sort of green or blue graph, and T2 represented by the purple graph. And T2 is higher temperature than T1. So what do you see when the temperature increases? Well, temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. So a higher temperature means a higher average kinetic energy of the particles. It's like moving from driving in the city to driving in the highway. Cars in the highway drive with a, a higher average kinetic energy than do cars in the city. And not only do they drive at a higher average speed or a higher average kinetic energy, they collide with a higher average kinetic energy. So collisions on the highway are much more energetic than collisions in the city. Uh, by analogy then, here particle collisions at a higher temperature have an average higher kinetic energy than do at a lower temperature. So what you see here, if we consider the entire shaded area under the graph, is these are all collisions at the higher temperature that have enough kinetic energy to give rise to effective chemical change. So there are a great deal more collisions at a higher temperature, represented by the total shaded area, that, that could possibly give rise to chemical chains than there are at the lower temperature. At the lower temperature, we're talking about this much smaller shaded area. And again, as the system goes from T1 to T2, the average kinetic energy of the particles in the system increases, as does the temperature. The total kinetic energy of their collisions also therefore increases. And as a result, more collisions have sufficient energy to react, and the reaction speeds up. Very interesting graph. Uh, the following equation is interesting. It represents a reaction between two hydrogen sulfide molecules and three oxygen molecules to produce the, the given products. However, uh, consider the chances of five particles coming together all with enough energy and all with the proper orientation to chemically react. I think you can see it's very unlikely to happen. In fact, if you look at the mathematics of it, effective four particle collisions and effective three particle collisions are also very highly unlikely. Under collision theory, the only collision with any probability of occurring with any frequency is a collision between two particles. So central to collision theory is the notion that all chemical reactions occur through a series of eff effective two-particle collisions. So it takes a number of two-particle collisions for a chemical reaction to occur. Um, each of the two-particle collisions will have its own activation energy and requires the particles to come together with the proper orientation. We now rename the overall chemical reaction, the reaction mechanism. And each two-particle collision is called an elementary step in that mechanism. And the slowest step in the, in the mechanism is re referred to as the rate-determining step. And if you're on your way to, um, to lunch, the cafeteria, it's the, the slowest person down the stairs who's going to decide when everybody eats because they're holding up the line. Collision theory is made a little more complicated when we look at reversible chemical reactions. Um, since both forward and reverse reactions occur at the same time, there must be effective collisions of both reactants and products taking place at the same time. Uh, so here we show a reversible reaction, and reversible reactions are covered in the, the equilibrium unit of this course. Um, suffice it to say, for now, that a great many chemical reactions proceed both in, for, in the forward direction and the reverse direction at the same time. Here we show both the formation and the decomposition of hydrogen chloride gas. And here's the potential energy diagram for the reversible reaction. You'll see that on the left we show the reactants of the forward reaction, which is the hydrogen and, and the chlorine gas. And on the right we show the products of the forward reaction, which is the HCl. And as we proceed from left to right, we show a hump, which is the activation energy for the forward reaction. As the potential energy comes from reactants over the activation energy and down to the product level of potential energy. However, you see that there's a much higher hump uh, 
as we proceed in reverse from the products of the forward reaction back to the reactants of the forward reaction. And that much higher hump, represented by this much higher arrow, is the activation energy for the reverse reaction. What's not affected, you'll see, is delta H. The enthalpy change for the forward reaction and the enthalpy change for the reverse reaction are equal, but they're opposite. And you often see these graphs with two-headed arrows. I find that a frustration. Depending on whether or not you're talking about the forward or the reverse reaction, these arrows typically require a single arrowhead. And again, note there are activation energies for both the forward and the reverse reactions. Note that the enthalpy change for the forward and reverse reactions are equal and opposite. And we've seen that before when we talked about formation reactions and decomposition reactions. And here's a second look at the um, potential energy curve. A catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical process. Catalysts themselves are not chemically altered in the reaction. And that's something to remember. Um, without going into too much detail, because the chemistry of catalysts, catalysts is extremely complex, catalysts are thought to speed up chemistry by providing an alternative pathway for the chemical reaction to occur. And the alternative pathway will have a lower activation energy requirement. So if it has a lower activation energy, then you require a much lower energy input for the reaction to take place. And, and as a result, at any given temperature, more collisions will have sufficient energy to be effective. And the following graph explains the effect. This is also sort of a famous graph that I've tweaked a bit. The y-axis is collisions and the x-axis is, is, is kinetic energy. And you'll see there's two vertical arrows. The vertical arrow on the left is the activation energy for the reaction if there's no catalyst present. And you'll see it's much higher than the activation energy uh, uh, where there's a catalyst present, represented by the second arrow on the left. So uh, with no catalyst present, you've got a much smaller subset of collisions that have enough energy to be effective. But as you lower the energy requirement, as you lower the activation energy, you have a great many more collisions that have enough energy uh, to be um, effective collisions. And here is another, uh, here's a potential energy diagram now that uh, illustrates this effect. Uh, and what I want you to take notice of is that the activation energy hump is much lower with a, a catalyst present. So we're going, we're, we're going from reactants to products, and you'll see that the green curve represents activation energy for the forward reaction where there's no catalyst present. Whereas the purple curve, which is a much lower activation energy, represents activation energy where there's a catalyst present. So again, because the energy requirement has been lowered, more collisions are going to have enough energy to react at the same temperature um, with a catalyst present. And I'm going to conclude my lecture there and refer you to any homework that you might be assigned by your teacher. This is a large reading piece. I believe there's an entire chapter dedicated to collision theory in your textbook. Um, I would, again, get into the uh, many of the theoretical concepts uh, assigned in the questions. Um, there's no reason that, because this is such a, a comprehensive whole, there's no reason you, you can't master it with, uh, without sufficient work being put in. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you found that of some value. That concludes uh, my lectures, subject to review of all diploma questions. Um, I'm now moving on to discuss, um, I believe it's electrochemistry. Thank you.